and welcome to the Open Book channel. My name is Lady Valheim, your designated open book. This is my second video in a three-part series in which I talk about how I was pinned into being a self-employed indie publisher because of the miscategorization and standards of my government. The Canadian government, by the way. Some people can say they can tell because of my accent, but I don't know which one they're talking about. The first video that I made is essentially a longer version of this video. It goes into a lot more detail about my personal life and the circumstances that fed into the culmination of this situation that I found myself in. Due to its more intimate recounting of events, I've made the first video in this series only available exclusively to patrons on my Ko-fi, so if that interests you, there will be a link in the description below. All that said, in this video and in a much more flat facts manner, I will be going over the order of events in my life over the last few months, the determining factors that my government used to declare me a small business owner against my will and intentions, and then I'd like to talk about the implications that my case study presents as a danger for other small creators out there relying on any form of benefits to support themselves. Here's a quick summary of events. Event point one. I'm a Canadian, born and raised citizen, living in cottage country, and I was laid off from my full to part-time general labor position. Event point two. Knowing that I'd more than likely be laid off at the start of that month, I preemptively set myself up with things to do over the winter. So I started an online course to learn a bit more about the publishing industry and what I'd be required to know if, someday, I ever wanted to start a business. And I registered a business name as a placeholder to ensure that it would eventually be available when I someday wanted to use it. I thought that Acidic Inc. was cute and I wanted to start integrating it into my social media without the risk of however many years down the line someone else had taken the handle on me. You'll note that I took both of these actions with the intention of someday in mind. The online certificate course I took was not valid as any form of post-secondary credential, it's only a curiosity course, and the business name that I registered was under a sole proprietorship, which expires in five years if nothing is done with it, and has no requirements of upkeep, so registering a sole proprietorship in and of itself shouldn't imply that my intentions were to spontaneously become a business owner, at least not a full-time, all-in, right-now business owner. Event point three, having worked as a general laborer in a seasonally fluctuating job field, I planned to go on employment insurance to see me through the winter, just as all my co-workers were expected to do. Event point four, after being laid off and plugging away at my side projects, I had a phone interview with my assigned employment insurance agent, in which I was deemed ineligible for benefits due to my commitment to my writing and consequently my small business. That's the short version of events, which may sound typical or expected to anyone outside of the creative sphere and terrifying to anyone in it. Like any self-published author out there, I've taken steps over many years of writing to cultivate an image of semi-professional quality. I mean, no one wants their work to be dismissed or passed off as trash. It's not unusual to take an online course on improving your craft or do research into the current state of the publishing industry. I think just about anyone would agree that to be a creator, you're expected to cultivate a brand, which in my mind logically included a BN. That amount of effort in research and branding is the standard for anyone that takes writing seriously. I'd argue that it's a prerequisite, because garnering any amount of success and reputation as an author is dependent on already being established in those regards, having quality and having a brand. So it was a bit of a shock to me when I was denied financial benefits that I was depending on, and was otherwise entitled to, on the basis that I took my writing too professionally. Primarily because the amount of time and effort that I put into writing hadn't changed from when I was working my full-time job. It was only having attention drawn to it because I no longer had a full-time job. In the pursuit of being perceived as a writer of semi-professional quality in the writing community, I had, in turn, legitimized myself in the eyes of my government as a full-time, self-employed small business owner. I go over the nuances more in my first video, but at this point, I'm sure you'd like to know what their standards of determination were to classify me as a small business owner when I'm just a no-name self-published writer who's never made a dime from my ebooks. The three major things that the Canadian government used to declare me as self-employed were whether I would return to employed work based on a hypothetical, intentions to make literally any money over the winter, and time investment. I answered all of these things wrong because they were questions heavily based in hypotheticals which had no room to accommodate the nuances of the conditions of my situation. For example, the agent asked me if I'd return to work at my previous job if 
I manage to be successful making anything under my business name? To which I said, no, of course not. Because that's the honest response of any writer struggling and working full-time somewhere else. We would all much rather be making a living doing something that we love. But that question relying on an if and me having to answer no ignores the probability of being successful in the publishing industry, regardless of what I'm actually doing in it. There's a reason that we don't all up and quit our day jobs to be writers and artists or content creators. That's just crazy talk, and we don't want to starve. Unfortunately, because I had what could be seen as building blocks to start my small business and intentions to pursue that as a financial option someday, I was considered too competent not to be determined as genuinely pursuing my small business right now. I'm sure there's a lot of small businesses out there that start with a lot less under their belts, I guess, but they also aren't based in something as unpredictable as the creative industry. Asking whether I intended to make any money through my business aim was, likewise, entirely absent of context of what being a creator entails. I was asked, do I intend my business to be my primary income? To which I said no, <laughs> on the basis that it was not an income. I intended employment insurance to be my primary income, and my intentions were to pick up a freelance job or two over the winter, if I could, to earn a bit of money but mostly to just accumulate reputation. At no point did I expect my business to support me, because I didn't have the intention of starting a small business in earnest all of a sudden right now. And for anyone outside of Canada, a little extra context, you can earn money while you are on EI. It's encouraged to pursue work while on employment insurance, actually. It's a requirement to get EI that you have a willingness to work. They just require that you report any income that you happen to make so it can be deducted from your benefits. And that's exactly what I intended to do and honor that arrangement, but because the government perceived my ownership as a small business owner viable and my intentions to support myself with it genuine, I would not be able to receive EI in the first place. To then make 20 bucks every now and then, beta reading or making a friend an ebook cover, etc. I was cut off from benefits because of the perception that I would make money on my own, not the likelihood that I would ever make money on my own. The most dangerously out of context question that they used to determine my status as a small business owner, however, was time investment. This is the one that I think all creators out there need to be aware of. At what point will governing bodies decide your hobby is now your business, or your job, or a job? <laughs> and the answer is 15 hours a week spent on business-related activities, which hopefully sounds a bit outrageous to you if you're a content creator. No matter what you're doing, if you're doing it well or with any amount of passion, you're bound to spend more than 15 hours a week on it. But that, to the Canadian government, is considered a cutoff from benefits, because doing more than 15 hours would theoretically interfere with your ability to maintain an alternative employment full-time job. I spent more than 15 hours a week writing while I was working on my last job. The only thing that changed was the absence of my full-time job, which obviously left me with a little more time to devote to my business. And I didn't deny that to the agent that I was talking to, because I am incapable of lying. Hello? <laughs> Have you met me? And when pressed, I bent into saying what they wanted to hear, which is devoid of context of the situation. Yes, I would probably be spending 40 hours a week writing, or beta reading, or working on an ebook cover, and that also disqualifies me from benefits, because that cutoff doesn't care about the conditionals that I'm only spending that much time doing those things because I have no other job, not because I am actively choosing not to have one for the sake of my writing or hobby. I'll admit that I am naive, and I didn't expect that my meager status as a writer and the steps that I'd taken to make myself seem like a good writer would legitimize me as self-employed to my government, but I reserve the right to criticize their means of determining me ineligible to financial support that I expected to rely on as a laid-off worker, because they are, in a lot of ways, biased against creatives, who are already disadvantaged enough, because their questions don't take into consideration the viability of different industries, or that time doesn't inherently translate to sustainability. It feels biased because I wouldn't be considered self-employed if I spent as much time doing something like snowshoeing instead of writing, if I entered vegetable growing contests instead of entering writing submissions, if I hadn't drawn attention to myself by taking a course or reserving a business name, I wouldn't have been denied benefits because nothing would have changed. It would have been seen as the same non-profitable hobby that I've had for years now. 
I think a good way to put emphasis on the drastic conclusion that my livelihood is now suddenly reliant on a publishing business that I haven't even started up yet is an analogy. Let's say I worked for a restaurant and the restaurant went under and I needed to apply for employment insurance. Let's say that I had a Facebook page with a brand something like Mystic Jewelry where I made and sold jewelry, but you know, it's just like the home starter kit where all of the gems and the bands are pre-made and it's just a matter of putting them together. And I sold one bracelet every month. Would the jewelry hobbyist be denied financial support on the premise that she has a business? The method of determining legitimacy seems highly inconsistent. Presumably, if our hypothetical woman didn't mention her jewelry, she'd receive benefits just fine. But if they found out that she made an extra 30 bucks in her pocket a month, she would also be denied like I was. If I had taken one step back and been adamant that no, I have no intentions to run a business right now, regardless of what it looks like my intentions are to you, would I have been accepted? I'm really not sure. Because again, I have made absolutely zero profit off of what I'm doing, but my small business name that I haven't done anything with yet has been determined viable, and now I am meant to rely on it. But as it stands currently, because I've been determined to be self-employed, I have two options. The first is to appeal against their decision in a couple months, which unfortunately runs the risk of appearing to commit fraud. Trying to contextualize my intentions with the business that I registered would more than likely be seen as lying, that I'm trying to get free money from the government. They've determined my intentions, so it's their word against mine. And if they are set on their standards of determining someone self-employed, there's not much that I can do to argue with it but disband the business entirely. Throw everything that I've done in the trash so that they can't point at it and use it as justification to call me a small business owner. They don't care that I'm currently non-profitable. That's a me problem. Even in that scenario of getting a reevaluation, though, that's several months away. So what am I supposed to do but prove them right? Go all in on trying to make this business an actual thing because I have no other options. Either way, I've been committed to hemorrhaging my savings, so I might as well try to run a business. And in case you're interested, I do go over more in my first video that no, I actually currently do not have the option to just get another job. So that's my story, my case study if you will. How I ended up here, why, and some speculation about what this could mean for other small creators that might find themselves in a similar situation. If you are laid off from your day job and you have any form of branding behind you, you need to be very clear what your intentions are with that brand. or your intentions will be determined for you, and potentially used against you. And I'm not going to dwell on the hypotheticals my evaluation depended on, like if I managed to make my business work, would I work other places, could I make any money, how much time will I spend on things. Just be safe out there. Don't commit fraud, of course, but don't let your intentions be set by someone else, especially if it's going to land you financially devastated, like me. So, shameless self-plug, I've started a small business, I guess. Woohoo! <laughs> you can check out the website that I am still trying to get fully up and running in the description below. If you need some publishing-related services like beta reading or book covers, just send me a message. I am now desperately looking for work. And if you'd like to support me and the content that I create, I have a Ko-fi linked in the description below. Thank you for watching, keep an eye out for the next installment in this series, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!